Good afternoon, President Ilves, and good morning to the Brazilian audience. The presence here today of a former president of Estonia is sponsored by Grita and its members. Grita is a citizenship movement. It's a nonprofit launched in 2020 to inspire voters to raise their voices and join efforts to campaign and elect a Congress and a Senate in Brazil that truly represents the aspirations of the Brazilian society. The objective of Grita is to identify good candidates in a non-partisan way, independently of political parties, to help elect a significant number of quality congressmen and congresswomen. We will then push towards an ethical transformation of the Brazilian parliament. Without much ado, I would like to introduce to you a former president of Estonia, someone who has been a key protagonist and driver of the political transformation of his country in the last 30 years, after Estonia restored its independence in 1991. Thomas Hendrik Ilves, he was ambassador of Estonia to the United States in 1993. He was minister of foreign affairs twice from 1996 to 1998, and again from 1999 to 2002. He was a member of the European Parliament from 2004 to 2006. And he was the fourth president of Estonia for 10 years from 2006 to 2016. The event today will have two parts, a 40 minutes talk by President Ilves, followed by 20 minutes Q&A session. President Ilves, it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. So please tell us about the remarkable political transformation of Estonia in the last 30 years. The floor okay. is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your kind <clears throat> introduction. And uh, I'm very happy to, to be here to speak to, to Grita. Um, well, I, I'm sorry to say where to start, but uh, basically we came from a very bad place since Estonia had been an independent country until 1940, and then we were occupied by the Soviet Union, and then we were occupied by Nazi Germany, and then we were occupied again by the Soviet Union. And uh, it was pretty bad, I would say. <laughs> uh, no real freedom. Uh, it was a communist system, no property, no rights. No, no one could leave the country. Well, no one could go to the West. And so um, under, under the kind of loosening of perestroika during the Soviet Union, uh, its biggest effect actually in Estonia, I would say, was that it uh, allowed civil society to reemerge because there had been no civil society under the Soviet Union. Everything was atomized and all civil society structures had been destroyed. And you could either belong to the Communist Party, to the Komsomol or a trade union, but other than that, you couldn't belong to anything. But as things began to open up in the late 1980s, uh, people began to think seriously about independence and reestablishing independence, and more importantly, what kind of country we want once we uh, do become independent, since it seemed that it was possible to do so. And so this began, I would say, before actual independence, uh, sort of two, three years of very broad based discussions um, on what kind of economy we wanted, what kind of constitution we wanted, what kind of what are what is important, what is not important, uh, which got to the point where already in the, the, the second year of this, various people were, were having discussion groups, writing papers on sort of, uh, I mean, academic papers on what an economy should look like, what, the, what kind of government we should have. 
So when we did become independent and uh, reestablished our independence on the 20th of August, 1991, within three weeks after that, we already had our constitutional convention in place with its delegates uh, with, that included a broad range of, uh, we didn't have political parties quite then yet, but political interests from the left to the right. And uh, that lasted that, I mean, that uh, constitutional convention was uh, lasted about well, seven months, eight months. And it came up with a constitution that was basically promoting a, um, a uh, parliamentary system. Uh, the idea, the reason why we went for a parliamentary system was that they have, uh, parliamentary systems have a much better record for democracy. And I can say already, I remember reading in the late 1980s, a study done of um, parliamentary versus presidential systems that then this is before communism collapsed. So it was actually looking mainly at Latin America and and Africa and Western Europe, but it was already clear then that countries that had parliamentary system had a far better track record of uh, staying democracies than presidential systems. And since that time, if you look at the record of the former communist world, you'll see that uh, uh, all of the countries with problems with authoritarianism have them because they have presidential systems and the countries, and some of them even switched. I mean, Ukraine and Georgia switched from uh, presidential systems. And because I guess the main problem is that when you have a president who's there for too long, he starts to like power and doesn't want to give it up and does maybe some things he doesn't want people to know about. And so the president doesn't want to leave and begins to play around with that. So that was one of the key decisions. Um, and the other key decision that we did before we had our real first democratic election was to establish our own currency. Again, we did that against the advice of the IMF, but we established a currency board system, which uh, afterwards was adopted by many countries that came out of the kind of the communist system. Uh, currency board that basically limits you to uh, you cannot emit more currency than you have reserves for, but that does have the benefit of making your currency uh, convertible. So that was a big step. But we had our first elections, and we had a very young uh, the elections were uh, won by several parties that contained had many young people in them. And uh, because they were young and courageous and radical, uh, they were in their mid to late twenties or to mid to uh, mid twenties to mid thirties. But a whole series of reform were passed in um, about two years. Dramatic reforms uh, regarding property, uh, privatization. Uh, restitution of property. Uh, key, some of the key things, and oh, I, sh I, should, I should go back. One of the other key elements of our constitution was a very strong emphasis on fundamental rights and freedoms. That is what also was crucial to us. So freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, but back to the government. We then, as I said, passed a number of key reforms um, privatization was one key issue because we had only state-owned uh, enterprises, uh, many of which had just been, uh, I mean, which were for former companies that we had, uh, uh, but were, <clears throat> but had been nationalized by the communists. But then what we did and why we were more successful than many other countries was that we did not follow the voucher privatization scheme that uh, Jeffrey Sachs pushed on to many countries, including Russia. The problem with the voucher privatization scheme is that when you uh, issue every employee of a state enterprise uh, stocks as vouchers, uh, the vouchers, all, as you can imagine from the way <laughs> markets work, almost immediately lose all value. And as they, they become incredibly cheap, and then this is what allowed the rise of the oligarchs in Russia and Ukraine and 
many other countries. The oligarchs came about because they were people who had access to larger amounts of money. And so they bought lots and lots of um, uh, stock in state, uh, very, I mean, in state owned enterprises. So you can see sort of a multi billion dollar company like, uh, um, like the nickel company uh, was bought for. Uh, for three hundred million dollars, when it was probably worth uh, fifteen or twenty billion dollars, uh, and that's th that's what Abramovich did. I mean, this is the same story repeated over and over and over again that the people had access to cash, bought up um, state-owned enterprises, and then they became, and then the state-owned enterprises were worth a lot more, and they became very rich, and they have dominated. Um, Russian politics, and also in the case of Ukraine, they dominated Ukrainian politics for years because they were ha have so much money. Uh, that was one crucial thing is the nature of privatization. Uh, we used that German uh, Treuhand model of uh, highest bidder uh, for companies uh, coupled with some kind of uh, overview of the social considerations so that you wouldn't just buy a company and fire everybody. The other key element looking back on what we did was, um, was uh, our law on government, uh, which uh, uh, the law on government uh, allowed us to avoid a problem in many, many, many countries, both, uh, uh, both Western and Eastern, which was that, um, uh, the it established a civil service, and that meant that if you have a minister, the minister, well, in our case, we're a small country, you can have two advisors, but that's the, those are the only political appointees. Everyone else is a civil servant, and the highest ranking person is the permanent undersecretary, who is a is a career uh, civil servant or career foreign officer. Uh, and then the ministry, therefore, um, remains as a professional ministry, even if the government changes. So if you have a new parties in power, it doesn't change the, the work of the ministries, which is, a, again, looking back, is a key element uh, for, for, be, for success, I would argue, since there are so many countries, and it's not just the Eastern ones, it's also even you have to look at countries like Austria, where they had this so-called proport system, where basically the, the civil servants are divided up after every election, as depending on what party they belong to. All of that leads to horrible stagnation, I would say. So, um, I mean, and also just political manipulation. So we have, we have been lucky to have a professional civil service already since uh, 1995 in this regard. So, but I mean, so those are the structural reforms. Uh, I mean, I didn't get into like all of the land reform and other things, but, but, the, the, but we still, had one problem, which was we were extremely poor. And uh, if you know Zeno's paradox of uh, Achilles running after the rabbit, or the, or the rather running after the tortoise, uh, Zeno said, well, look, I mean, it, if the Achilles runs halfway to where the tortoise is, the tortoise still moves a little bit, and you'll never catch up with the tortoise in Zeno's paradox. But that is the problem of development, is that we can do all kinds of things, but we won't catch up with the other countries because they will always be ahead of us. And if uh, even if we grow 8% a year from a low level, we still will not catch up to a growth of 2% on the part of the rich countries. Uh, and moreover, we had huge amounts of work to do because we had such backward infrastructure from 50 years of communism and something had to be done. So that was where I kind of entered the picture, which was that um, since I did have a background in IT, um, I uh, went in um, 1993, the first web browser, Mosaic, came out. 
you had to buy it. You had to go to a store and you got seven floppy disks and you'd upload it. And before that, there was, there was no, unless you were really highly specialized, you couldn't really even access the World Wide Web. So he was the first web browser. And I looked at this thing and I said, wow, this is the one area where it, we are all on a, a level playing field. We are no more or no, we are no less advanced than the United States or Germany or Japan. We're all starting out with this thing. And I was convinced this was the way to go. But to give you an idea of where we were, I mean, we had Finland. Finland uh, was a country, Finland is a country, in 1938, the last full year before World War II, uh, Estonia had a slightly higher GDP per capita than Finland. Not much, but slightly higher. When we became independent again, eh, the first full year of 1992, the, the GDP per capita of Finland was eight times, not just even 8%, eight times higher than our GDP per capita. It was just a huge difference. And that basically showed that uh, well, how bad <laughs> communism was for development, but also uh, since Finland's economy was largely had a strong tech component, uh, I argued that Estonia as well should um, invest heavily in, uh, in tech and tech education. And that was the beginning of what is called, and you can look it up, the Tiger Leap, which was to, uh, I propose we digitize all of the schools and connect all the schools and teach kids how to use computers. So, and from there on, I mean, basically that's how things developed. Uh, in the beginning, in 2000, 2001, we realized that we really needed a much stronger system for digitization. And we started our, what the, built the system we currently have had now for 22 years. The main feature is that you can do anything and everything in relating in the citizen relationship with the government, except for three things. You, you cannot get married online, you cannot get divorced online, and you cannot buy or sell physical property, that is land or apartments or houses. Uh, you have to show up for that because, uh, well, we were concerned, and I think rightly so, about... Um, uh, well, what we see in New York and London and, uh, and the, the Riviera, which is that anonymous shell companies with no clear beneficial owner buying all kinds of property, which will end up in situations such as having, um, uh, well, the mafioso from Russia buying apartments in Trump Tower, which I guess is kind of like the worst possible case, but that has in fact happened. Now, so what is it that allowed us to do this? Well, uh, most importantly, I would argue is that um, we had strong support among the citizenry, a very strong desire to move ahead, uh, to, to, to be part of the West. Um, uh, the psychology was, well, we had been there, we had been a moderately successful country, then came sort of communists and Nazis and communists, and they had destroyed the country for us, and we never want to be in that situation again. And that certainly motivated many of our reforms uh, in that we did the way to best accomplish that, uh, I argued, and people listened, was that we had to join the European Union and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, the EU for rule of law and for economic reasons, and NATO for security. And that was what we worked on for many, many years. That was my entire foreign ministry period, 96 to 2002, was um, devoted to that. So... And that certainly was uh, one of the reasons why it reforms were somewhat easier since we knew what we had to do. I mean, for, in a sense, from the European Union, you are presented with a template of good governance that we followed. Um, you don't have to join the European Union, but the kind of reforms that they require for joining were crucial for us. Uh, 
And that was um, certainly one of the reasons for our current success. Digitization also is something which I think has played an enormous role in the success of Estonia because uh, by digitizing public services, we essentially eliminated one of the main sources of corruption in society. Uh, as you probably know, there are two kinds of corruption. There's grand corruption, and that's when ministers get lots of money for, for, for doing a tender uh, or, sort of in a, or not doing a proper tender, but uh, showing preference. But the other kind of uh, the other kind of um, corruption, petty corruption, low-level corruption, and that is uh, where citizens find that for any public service they have to pay to get it. That is, you have to pay to get something that you shouldn't have to pay for at all, but uh, that is part of the government service. But that's how many governments, in fact, fund their their underpaid civil servants, which is that they assume that civil servants will take or demand money for any any kind of uh, action. I mean, to get to get your pension, to get some, to get medical care, whatever. Um, and by eliminating that through digitization, it basically eliminate you can do if you can do everything online. Uh, you don't your the, the, this really cuts through corruption. I mean, a kind of example is that, which is a persistent problem in many, many post-communist countries are corrupt traffic police who will then, um, you will, uh, if you are speeding, uh, they'll, you, you will have a high fine, but if you pay the policeman some uh, less money, you'll get, you'll get off. Well, you can't do that in Estonia because we only accept, um, as evidence, uh, radar information with a time and who, who recorded the traffic, uh, the speeding uh, incident. And only then will you be fined. So if you're speeding, uh, the computer will tell you that you've been speeding and the traffic policeman doesn't really do anything other than take your address and phone number. So this has helped, I think, our society to a huge degree is that we have very low corruption. We have, we are not only are the least corrupt of former communist countries, but we're one of the least corrupt countries in the European Union, including all kinds of countries that were never had communism, but they're still more corrupt. Um, and so, uh, I mean, this all took time. It doesn't happen overnight. It has been 30 years. Um, today, our GDP per capita, I don't know what it is most recently, 35, 36, 37,000 a year. Uh, we started at $2,800 a year when we became independent. So it's a fairly dramatic change. Uh, we are a country with low corruption. Uh, we are a country of... Um, uh, very forward leaning on technology and technological solutions as something that we keep doing all the time. Um, and I would say the biggest challenge we have is becoming too comfortable with our success because we are more successful than many of the, even the older uh, countries in the European Union uh, or the, the ones who've been there for a long time. Uh, our GDP per capita now exceeds Spain. Uh, GDP per capita and well who knows what's going to happen with the war and with COVID but at least if the trajectory that we were on still last year continue would have it continues we will be have a higher GDP per capita than Italy which was a founding member of the European Union. So looking back on the things that um, that mattered the most I would certainly say that um, I would rank, first of all, sort of uh, the depoliticizing governance so that minister, I mean, governments can come and go, but the civil servants remain there. Um, secondly, digitization was clearly a, a key to establishing a clean form of governance and also effective 
uh, effective uh, public uh, goods that can be accessed easily. Uh, this is very important in a country that has um, low population density. I mean, our cities have or have high uh, population density, but I, for example, live in the countryside and its uh, services are generally far away from where I am, but I can basically accomplish everything I want uh, at my computer. And so anything that facilitates and assists in developing digital infrastructure, be it the hardware side, so connections, I mean, broadband, or the software side, which is more, more a matter of uh, really um, developing good applications so you can do everything online, uh, that certainly makes it possible to have um, people living in the countryside without too much hardship and reducing the kind of pressure to urbanize. If we look back, certainly uh, all of the uh, key, key elements of uh, a successful country played a part. I mean, economic reforms were vital. Um, the privatization, especially important. Um, but that was in the beginning afterwards, especially in the more tech area era that began in 2000, um, what became important was rather new companies, startups. We are number one in the world right now with unicorns per capita. We have 10 unicorns in this country. Uh, that's countries, uh, companies with evaluations of over 1 billion. So we basically, as a small country, we have a unicorn for every 130,000 people. V large, rich companies that were started domestically, that had international IPOs, but really they are Estonian companies um, and uh, have done very well. And now uh, basically seven or eight percent of the working population is involved in the tech field, which is very, very high. Rather, sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> got it wrong. 3% of the population is involved in the tech field, but it produces 7 to 8% of GDP. So uh, sorry about that screw up there, but, uh, um, but the GDP of our country is highly tech dependent, but fortunately there are different kinds of high tech companies. Clearly education has played a vital role in this. And Estonia has been for the past 10 years, number one or number two uh, in Europe on the PISA tests, uh, the tests put out by the OECD for, uh, for um, secondary, uh, secondary students uh, competence in math, science, and language. Uh, the for the last several years, we've been number one in Europe or say the Western world, because this includes the United States and Canada um, among OECD countries. Asians, of course, are still ahead. We are, we're number six in the world, uh, but everyone in Europe is behind us. Uh, but of course, South Korea, Japan, uh, uh, who else is down there? <laughs> Singapore. Uh, the Beijing area, Taiwan, those are the five that are really the leaders in especially math and science. But when it comes to the non-Asian world, then we're number one. And number two is Finland, um, uh, which is another sort of uh, another country that uh, like Estonia and our northern neighbor and very closely related to us linguistically, another country that has put huge emphasis on quality of education. Um, I should say, Finland has played a strong role in all of this. Uh, Finnish and Estonian are closely related languages, kind of like or analogous to Spanish and Portuguese, uh, which uh, Estonians understand Finnish. Finns don't really bother to understand us that much, but 
So I think it's like that, at least on the Iberian Peninsula. It's, I don't think it's like that in Brazil, but certainly on the Iberian Peninsula where the Portuguese all understand Spanish, but Spaniards don't bother to learn Portuguese. But that's, that's just a side comment. Um, now, if you think about, well, what can we do with Brazil, which has a far larger population? Um, well, I would say that there, I mean, there are things that are size dependent and there are things that are not size dependent. And uh, most clearly um, things such as, um, and there's also things which are you know, basically historical, I mean, historical traditions. Certainly I would, I mean, the one thing that's easiest to do, it's it may be expensive, but the easiest thing to do is actually affect a serious technological transformation of society, making uh, broadband access and computers available to a very, I mean, to as many people as possible. If you do that, then what you can do is actually create the services online that allow you to overcome the traditional problems of a of a, of running a country, reducing corruption, making services more efficient, and also eliminating the the kind of differences that come from living in the countryside or living outside the main cities, and all of that can be accomplished with smart with smart. Uh, well, basically investments in tech and also in the software side or how you actually develop this. The main, I mean, the thing that I think looking back on it, I, I didn't think about when I came out with these ideas, but looking back on really what the, the biggest advantage of digitization is that the history of bureaucracy, since it was first invented 5,000 years ago, is that bureaucracy has always been a serial or sequential process. You have a piece of paper or you have a clay tablet or whatever, you go to some place, you hand it in, they take it, they look at it, it goes to the next office, then it goes to the next office, and then finally it goes through this long process and it comes back and it says, yes, you can do this or you can do that. Digitization makes that all a parallel process so that and an example of it is um, uh, was given to me by the man who designed the system. He had given his wife at his first child, and he said it was a terrible experience because he had to run from one office to get a birth certificate and another office to uh, get health insurance and a third office to find a doctor and so forth. Um, and so he did, when we were so 20 years ago when we were designing a system, he said, I would never want to do this again. And so he designed the system in a way that when a child is born in Estonia, the hospital asks, What is the name of the child? And then the parents said, The child's name is this. That is sent to the population registry um, digitally. And then the population registry assigns that child an ID number automatically the ID number goes to the, uh, to the birth certificate office. And then and automatically it also goes to the health insurance office and automatically goes to your local government because the amount of money a local government gets depends on how many citizens there are in the local government area. And so that happens instantaneously. And there is no running around on the part of the, of the poor father to get all these things done. It just happens automatically. And you can just see the same process over and over and over again happening in all kinds of areas. And this is uh, one of the benefits. Uh, certainly, I would say that in, when it comes to Brazil, that um, the sine qua non for an effective digital governance is, first of all, you need a secure digital identity. Uh, which uh, requires at bare minimum a digital ID card with a chip. You need it needs to be have the kind of um, it has to be designed so that each car, each identity is unique. It is secured by uh, two factor authentication and end to end encryption. But that's how I connect to everything. I am completely secure. 
Um, you need a good architecture. We designed our own architecture. We do not have a single central database, but rather data are all over and connected via your number. And then most, and also equally important is data integrity. Everyone is worried about privacy, but in fact, far more important than privacy is data integrity. The difference between the two is privacy. If someone, if someone finds out what my blood type is, data integrity or lack of it is if someone changes my blood type or the record of my blood type, which is, could lead me to die. Uh, certainly, the access to the internet is a key element, uh, and that we have done all kinds of things for 20 years. So basically, uh, we have internet everywhere almost, but, um, but uh, it, access is relatively cheap. It could be cheaper, but for example, every public building has, and every restaurant, everything has a Wi-Fi, has Wi-Fi. Um, it, it goes relatively quickly. We have not really had too many concerns about sort of uh, big brother society because as, and as I always argue is that actually the, um, the way we design the system is that um, uh, everything is logged so that uh, if anyone looks at your data that isn't supposed to, it immediately rings all kinds of bells and whistles and people get, people get in trouble uh, compared to, say, social media where there are no safeguards whatsoever. So I say there's, if you think that the state is big brother, then the real, the real problem is the little sister, which is social media, because social media takes goes around and tells everybody what they know about you. And that's basically what Facebook does, is that it takes your data and then sells it to everyone around. Um, and so I'm a strong advocate of digitization of, uh, of societies as a way to overcome problems of the 20th century. Uh, and there is no single model that works best, I would argue, but on the other hand, there are clear principles that need to be observed. And as I, I mentioned, then one is a, is a secure, unique identity from every person. And secondly, a robust architecture. And then third, integrity. A word on that, one of one things which is the difficult part of digitization, politically difficult is and what where many countries fall down and then do not digitize successfully. And that is you need the political will to make digital identities mandatory. You don't have to use a digital identity, but everyone must be assigned one. Now, why is that? It's very simple. If you, I mean, we know that if digital identities are voluntary, then 15 to 20 percent of the population will go and get one because they think it's cool and they 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 like the idea. 80 percent will not on their own get a digital identity. But soon if but, but what's the problem then? Well, then that means that no government agency ministry will actually invest in digitization because they'll say, well, why should I bother? 80% of the population still wants to do things on paper. And so they don't. And then you end up with this um, catch 22. Uh, the people who have, who have an identity, say 15%, well, they, they don't have any services to find. And then the other people don't really, the other people who don't have an identity don't even bother looking for a service. Whereas in my country, since you know that everything can be done online, then everyone uses their, their digital identity. And we have 99% of the population does its taxes online. 99% of prescriptions in Estonia are done online so that uh, I, all I need to do if I have a prescription is I, I mean, my doctor puts it into the system and I can go to any pharmacy in the country and I just ID myself and I get my medicine. So that's where, um, where I would say, I mean, that's the stuff I know and most about, but I consider that kind of crucial to our success. 
And when you look at Europe, you'll see that the countries that have, who have actually done serious digitization, and here I would say Estonia, Finland, Denmark, the Netherlands, we are doing much better than countries that may be, I mean, the richest country in Europe is Germany, but they are not digitized and it is an increasing problem for them because they are stuck in the 20th century when it comes to uh, all matters digital. Private sector can be fine, it can be very digital, but government services are still very paper-based and very slow and very behind. Now, you, the last question you have here, because I'm already speaking too long, is that military service. Well, we have a mandatory conscription for all males. It says you, they, they serve uh, 11, eight or 11 months, depending on what kind of, they can choose one that is sort of a longer term, but with more education or less and with less education. Um, we, you can volunteer for the military. Um, women are not mandatorily conscripted, but they can sign up. And I'd say about 5% of women do. Um, we allow people to own weapons, but you have to take a very detailed exam to to get permission to buy weapons or firearms and you have to go you have to you have an you also have an inspection of your house or your apartment to show that you keep your weapon under in a secure iron box and under lock and key but this is so the idea is that people can own weapons but you have to follow the rules you cannot buy a weapon without having the the, li the license to buy a, buy a rifle or a handgun. Um, you need, if you want to have a concealed weapon, uh, then you need another license. But uh, most people here, they, I mean, they don't really have handguns. Uh, lots of people in rural areas have rifles. Lots of people hunt here. I mean, people get their meat by hunting uh, moose. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what they do here. They have moose hunts. And then uh, and they come on a farm. Uh, I don't hunt, but hunters will ask me for permission and they'll come on my farm, which is about 80 hectares, which is big for Estonia. And then they will hunt and get uh, moose. Um, so that's basically, I don't know, I, it's a lot to cover and I probably miss a lot, but I figure I'll open up for questions and try to do the best I can to answer your questions. So, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, President Hughes. Uh, I have a few questions uh, from the audience, and uh, but they'll start, they are very specific. So I'll start from two or three very general questions. No? For instance, uh, what were the important factors to gain, to secure the political will to initiate and to sustain the transformation process? What were the important factors? Um, well, one most important was hating communism. <laughs> 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 I mean, it was so awful. I mean, we had such terrible experience. We had mass deportations. We had mass arrests. I mean, a lot of the things you there's going on in Ukraine today, we had that, you know, people being killed. Uh, later on, it was a little milder, but um, you couldn't really, you didn't have any freedom. Very helpful for us was Finland because Estonians could see, I mean, because of the language issue that I mentioned, um, and we understand Finnish, we could watch Finnish television. And when you saw Finland became richer and richer, and we did not, people began to say, well, what is it that we need to do if we want to be like Finland? Well, you need to make all kinds of reforms. So there was 
broad consensus that we need to uh, do radical reforms if we want to become like Finland, especially as I mentioned with the knowledge that in that one time, one time before communism, we had been ahead of the Finns. So that kind of inspired that envy, or I don't know if envy is the right word, but the idea of a of a role model that was successful that we wanted to be like um, was uh, important, I think, for us as well. But the main thing is that people really just did not want to live the way they did, had been living and were therefore willing to, to do things that um, other societies maybe were not. Um, having a knowledge, however, of other I mean, of Finland, I think was important because no other country that came out of communism did as radical reforms as we did. Uh, and others were much slower. Many countries copied us actually, uh, former communist countries. And I've spent 20 years advising former communist countries on what on economic and especially digital reforms and transportation transformation. And in fact, I've even advised a number of non formerly, I mean, countries that never were communist on how to do transformation. But I think the, 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 the thing that's always important is you have to have people wanting to do it. And that was, uh, um, in my thinking, at least, I mean, the co unique combination of pushing digitization and my insistence that we start with young people because the young people were, are the ones who are most interested in uh, doing new tech things. And that was certainly the case in this country where much of the digitization was driven by, by young people. Mm -hmm. um, it was not a top-down uh, effort. It was something that was much more driven by young people and local governments uh, that were being pushed by civil society and by younger people. Uh, and so for at least for, when it comes to digital transformation, I would strongly recommend harnessing young people to get involved as much as possible. Thank you, thank you President Hughes. Uh, I've changed now to some more specific questions. Huh? So the first one is, how do the Estonian citizens, do they trust, do they approve online voting systems? Yes. But it's a very specific situation. And um, I start off, I do not recommend online voting for any country unless they do what we do, which is it's a complete, you need the whole ecosystem. We trust online voting because we vote, well, basically what do we do? We vote every two and a half years. I mean, we have, we have every four years, we have local elections. Every four years, we have national elections and every, five years, we have European uh, parliament elections. But the thing is, we use the same system daily for everything else. So we do it for all our banking, the same system for, I mean, they're private banks, but the banks use our state system, which is much more secure than any commercial security you can buy. We use it for banking. We do all, all our health care, everything we do daily, prescription. It's all done using this one system. So if you trust this one system for everything else, then you trust it for voting once every two and a half years. Whereas if you, I mean, so if you have a standalone, only digital voting system, I wouldn't trust it either. I mean, the only reason I trust my system is because I've never lost money. I've never had the wrong prescription. I've never had anything go wrong with my daily use of the Estonian system. But on the other hand, if someone says, we have this separate system, I would not you trust it at all. But we have, we started out with uh, the first election in 2005 had 0.3% of the population used it. And then it rose 
And for many years, it was around 30% of votes. And then, I don't know why, but then the last several elections, two elections have been almost 50%, uh, almost, I mean, about 46, 47%. So some kind of something changed to kick us up to that high a level. Um, again, there's no difference when we look at the results of um, voting in on paper across the country and you look at voting uh, and also voting or digitally, there are no political party preferences. It's not like parties, one party will get more votes digitally. So that is, that was one of the big objections. Oh, you're, you have all, all you know, you guys get all the digital people voting and we don't, therefore we're against. It doesn't, you know, we look, you look at the evidence and you see that basically um, there, is, there are no, no, it does not favor any political, particular political party. Young people vote a little more online than older people, but that difference has been disappearing quite a bit in this country. Um, what else? I don't know. I mean, it's, as I said, it's, it's, it's because it's part of the entire, what we call the ecosystem of Estonia, that, mm -hmm. that people trust it. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, President Hughes. I, I still have three or four specific questions. All you so, want, all you want. Uh, but but uh, I'm worried about your time because- No, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm great. I'm budget okay. my time. All right, great, excellent. So the next one is education. You mentioned very clearly how well Estonia has done on the education side, having the best uh, outcome in Europe and one of the best in the world. But the question I have here is about kids, young kids. When, at what age do they start using computers? And then uh, another question related to that, have you faced specific challenges to connect the schools all over the country? What were the challenges? Okay. I'll answer the second one first. That was my proposal and program in 1996 was connect all schools and put computer labs in all schools. And so, uh, and that started in 1996. In 98, 99, all schools were already online and all schools had a computer lab. Um, so this meant that every school had access to computers. Now, what we do, it's the, the whole, the computers are just integrated into the educational process so that things are done in the classroom, not just mathematics, but all kinds of things are simply in the curriculum and very important. And one, one feature that distinguishes Estonian education from many others is lots of homework. I mean, uh, you don't go to school in this country from you know, 8.30 to 3.30. Yes, you do go to school from 8.30 to 3.30. But what happens is that, you know, like in America, then you have maybe 15, 20 minutes of homework. In Estonia, you have, end up having four or five hours of homework. It's, it's, it's a rigorous educational system we have here. And we, it's a very demanding educational system. Uh, children get lots of homework and, uh, and, students are expected to do a lot you just when you i mean we we find that when students finish you know when they finish complete grade 12 that they know more than other school systems because they've had a more rigorous education they they know more math they know more science they know more history um they know more literature. I mean, I just have seen it with my own kids. You know, they, they read so much more um, than I did when I, I, you can tell from my accent, I went, I went to a very good public school system in the United States, but, uh, which was also one of the more demanding ones. But even there, I look at what my daughter has had to do and what I had to do, it is a much more demanding curriculum. 
but it, it, the computer side is strongly integrated into the educational system. Um, students do have computers uh, or families have computers. Uh, that's just something that was well, the consumer profile. I mean, one, we have basically not more, more than 90% of households have a PC at home or a laptop. Um, even though we're not that rich, but that's what people spend money on. And they realize that for to live in this society, you need to invest in some kind of computer and they do. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, now let's change to the taxation sector. Huh? The question I have here is, uh, how does the taxation system works in Estonia? Estonia? Do you have different taxes for services as compared to company taxes? Uh, what was the challenge to digitize the tax collection system? It is, it is as simple as it could possibly be. All taxes are 20%. Uh, income tax, personal income tax is 20% flat rate. Mm -hmm. um, corporate income tax, which is only on uh, dividends, 20%. VAT, 20%. It's, it's everything is flat. Um, and what we were, it, what it started out uh, the income tax, the income corporate and uh, personal income tax was 26%, but Digitization, for, well, there were two factors. One was digitization, which made it much more efficient. And the second thing was compliance. Um, that people, if you have a simple system, people are more willing to pay. And so we could lower our taxes because we got much more money the compliance rate went up. I mean, because, well, I mean, we just, we made enough. I mean, the budget was filled with, so nicely filled with, that we could lower the tax rate, which of course then made people happy. Politically, it was a great decision. It's very, and when you have a simple flat rate income tax, it is highly efficient. Uh, all companies or employers report how much they pay you go and I mean, it says how much you've been paid and then you look at it and go, yes, no. Uh, in this, there is a, uh, the salary, there is a, there's a, is a social tax paid for by the employer, which is 33%. And that includes then basically 13% for healthcare and then uh, and then the other, whatever it is there, 20% goes for social matters. So healthcare is, I mean, it's the whole thing together is 33%, but the 13 goes into this, the healthcare system. And the other one is for all the other social welfare things, unemployment and uh, disability insurance and all of those things. Okay, thank you. Just a final question from my side. You already mentioned the cybersecurity aspects, how the system uh, in Estonia is well secure. But the question uh, posed here by one of the audience members is what about criminal activities online? Radical political parties make trying to use the system and creating a risk to the democratic evolution of Estonia. Is that a problem? No, I mean, <laughs> because you can't do anything in our system unless you're identified. You can't anonymously enter anything. The only way you can, you can, you, you can go online is by having, I mean, you know we can go online for anything that's government related is by, identifying yourself securely, which you can do many ways. I mean, the most basic is you have, uh, 
I mean, the real simple, I never use this because it, we made it easier, but you have an ID card with a chip, you have a chip card reader, and you insert, and then you have through two-factor authentication identify yourself. I don't use that at all because I have one which is sort of a software system that does the same. But I would say that, um, I mean, to give you the difference between, between what we have and other people have, uh, I was, uh, for almost four years after I was president, I was, um, I was invited to Stanford University in Palo Alto. It is the Mecca, Mecca of IT. And Palo Alto, where I lived in a 12 kilometer radius are the corporate headquarters and, and also R&D for Tesla, Apple, Google, Facebook, Palantir, and YouTube, 12 kilometers radius. And they're all there. Um, but when I went to register, I had to register my daughter to go to school. And in order to do that, I had to take my electricity bill, and take my electricity bill, drive to the school headquarters, and then I had to present all my documents while I was there on a visa. So I had to get my passport, a visa, a special document from Stanford University that said I was employed there. And then the woman took all the papers and went and made photocopies of them. And then she came back and then she started copying by hand everything that I had there, my address, my daughter's name, blah, blah, blah. And I looked at this and I said, this is, how, this is, this is the 21st century in Estonia. If I want to register my child for school, I just get online. I do it and basically... Yeah, I mean, you go to school and one, if you change where you live, you then you go to a different school. So I just go online and say, I, my daughter now lives here and that is the, her school district. I mean, it's just, it happens like it's 30 seconds. Whereas, and this, I mean, it would have, if it had been somewhere else in America, I would have said, okay. But it is the, it is the home of Apple, Google, Tesla, Facebook, all of them. And it's that paper-based and primitive, which shows you that, the public sector in the United States is not in any way become digital. And so it's very, very primitive. Uh, it really has not moved much beyond where, it, where the public sector was before, before computers. And so uh, that's a very big difference. But in terms of security, because we precisely, because we have such a secure system, um, uh, we have not, we have had no real breaches. We have been attacked, yes. We've been seriously attacked, but they, but our system has not failed yet. Thank you. From my side, President Ilves is, uh, I just remains to thank you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your willingness to address a Brazilian audience. I can guarantee you that uh, all those listening to you are very pleased. And I just want to take uh, 30 seconds of your time and pass the word to the chairman of the GRITA Association. He just right. wants to express his thanks to you. Huh? Uh, President Hughes, on behalf of GRITA Associates and our guests today, I would like to thank you for this very informative and provocative speech that we got, we got here today. It is really one of the most precious feeling a Brazilian citizen can have today, hope. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. We, I should say, I should tell you, we have a few Brazilians in our tech sector now. <laughs> they moved to Estonia and work in some of our best companies. So they seem to like it. Maybe I should put you in touch with some of the our, some of the Brazilians here who uh, who uh, like Estonia very much and are very in, very much big fans of the uh, digital system. So I'll I'll call one of them and ask them and give you pass on the name to you. <laughs>